Hello everyone, we are with Baroness Odin today, member of the House of Lords of the UK for WDHF Talks Live and it is such a pleasure for me to conduct this interview today. We will be touching upon the impact of COVID-19, especially on gender issues, women and girls who face domestic and sexual violence. Welcome Baroness Odin. Thank you so much. It's a, such a, a privilege to be uh, joining you for this conversation. And I'm really looking forward to us uh, getting to know each other much more and Thank working together. Thank you so much. I would like to start with my first question to you. Uh, with the UK government slowly phasing the country back to as normal as possible, what role has the House of Lords had in the UK's collective response to the pandemic? What future considerations does the Chamber have planned? Ah, oh, it's very difficult, um, sort of very, um, I need to be very thoughtful to answering this uh, very first question. So what role has uh, the House of Lords played? First of all, we came back slightly later than the Commons, and I think it was to deep frustrations of members of the House of Lords. All of a sudden, House of Lords were not functioning. So as someone who's an active member of the House of Lords as, as a peer, I found that very frustrating not to be able to ask questions and not to raise um, concerns that has been expressed because, you know, I'm, I'm an activist. And so I was getting lots and lots of feedback all throughout the shutdown. I did take part in the first instance leading to the shutdown and I was gravely concerned about the fact that, you know, that I was being pressured to raise the issue particularly of, um, you know, the concerns around burial, Muslim burial, you know, because it was originally people were thinking that everybody will be cremated. Sorry to talk about such a, you know, kind of really uh, deep issues right at the top of the agenda, but death, was so imminent at that point people all they could talk about was their fear and their fear of losing loved ones and you know i'm sure your and my heart goes out you know i don't know what happened to your own family i lost some friends but alhamdulillah you know you know thank god that i didn't lose any member of my family but i could see the fear and the panic in, induced in by people. So it was incredibly difficult not to be an activist, not to be a parliamentarian, and not to be able to raise the kind of questions. So I think making government accountable has been very difficult uh, over the time that we've been back since May. And what I would say is that House of Lords, you know, because it's a very vibrant a house, it's an active house. It's not all the 800 members are active, but at least, you know, good 400 plus are very, very active. And those of us who are, uh, we found our best way to ensure that we can raise the questions on our return. And of course, it was assumed that it was going to be the House of Co Commons that would um, be able to utilize this a uh, brand new modern way of working with Zoom and Teams and all that. And uh, it was difficult in the beginning because I don't know whether you, know, you are aware, but I was one of the first person when I joined the House of Lords all those years ago at the age of 38. I was there. I went to the House's facilities to say, can I have a computer, please? To the horror of the administration saying, you know, this is not a working house as such, you know, what would you do with a computer? What would you do with a uh, mobile telephone, mobile technology? So um, I, I was familiar with ways of working. Nonetheless, there were lots of technical problems, as you know, with Zoom and Teams and all of that, there are lots of technical problems. So it meant, and the house, our average age is over 60, 65, 70, I think. So you can imagine some of the technical challenges that existed in us, you know, becoming a, a conducive place where we could debate and learn to debate uh, in absence of, absence of the ability to challenge ministers. So at the moment, for instance, how it functions, we're all allocated. We're only picked every day. We are picked. Maybe 50 people are picked up for a particular debate or 60 people are picked for a particular debate. So there's no 
you can't do, you know, you can't do be, you know, sort of instantaneous. You can't be impromptu. You know, you can, you have to wait your time. And if you say something and the minister has said something, you, there's no comeback. So you have to just say smile and be frustrated. So I think there has been that. But beyond that House of Lords as a house, uh, it's a very, you know, massive uh, legislature. And so, um, like I said, not everyone is present all the time. And we have really made sure that where is the uh, government in the commons, the members of parliament, are not necessarily able to challenge and overturn any decisions. In the House of Lords, we have been able to challenge and overturn decisions and ask the commons to think again. And that has been a constant source of, um, I suppose, hope and aspiration that when we pass legislations, when we debate things, that it's taken seriously. But uh, above all, I think the most frustrating thing has been, I would say, is that government legislations are coming to parliament weeks beyond when things have happened already. So like on health protection, say on the masks or on PPE, on those things that, you know, I've raised countless questions about disproportionality of where people have been ridden with poverty, who've not benefited from furloughs, who've not benefited from all the financial packages, business financial packages that the government, you know, put in. I mean, some of the financial measures would have been the stuff of dreams for socialist government, you know, labor government. But the Tory government actually, you know, were forced to come towards people and, and try and pick up where the state has never intervened as a Tory government. So I think that we've been able to demonstrate that it is possible. And I think we've done the best we can under the circumstances. Um, legislation, retrospective legislations are very, I think, harmful thing to democracy. And, but we've done that a lot. But each time we have an opportunity, we point that out to the government. But government itself, we have to acknowledge that. Whichever the government would have been, would have been facing this catastrophe on a, in a difficult challenge, in a different ways. Perhaps, you know, you, you would do it differently to the way I would do it. And I always, always keep on thinking, you know, like, uh, if there were more women, sorry, I mean, this is my bee in my bonnet. I think if there were more women leaders, I think the world would have been a better place simply because, you know, there, there would have been greater, you know, thinking, more lateral thinking, more cooperative government, more, you know, um, consideration for all range of people. I, I think women do that better. So, but I have to point out, I have four sons and four grandsons. So I'm very kind of um, in the zone where you have to work together as men and women. I've always done that. So, yeah, that, that's an amazing message, really. I cannot agree more. Um, yes, women leaders will definitely change the world, but we are going to do it with the men, really. And it's, you, you are such an inspiring example, really. Um, women uh, activists um, on gender issues, having four sons, it's an amazing story, really, out there. <laughs> I, tr I tried very hard. I have one daughter and, uh, and my daughter has given me one granddaughter. So I'm very blessed. Now, now, yes, I would have liked a whole band of women, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you mentioned that um, you're an ex-activist as well as um, your appointment to the House of Lords. Uh, you have also been involved with lots of community and local work, for example, working uh, for the charity at Action. Tower Hamlets, Women's Health Advocacy, or the New Home Council. What do you think will be the priority for small and local organizations such as these ones while the pandemic continues to disrupt our everyday lives? It's very difficult to say this without referring to a his, you know, history of injustices for women's organizations, right? And history of injustices to disadvantaged communities, disadvantaged women. I mean, my entire existence as a person, as a daughter, as a mother, as an activist, is about economic emancipation of women. 
I think, or economic emancipation of those who are disadvantaged. So if it's disabled people, if you do not empower them economically, then there is no sense of giving people, allowing people, enabling people, facilitating people from the ground up with rights and so that they can then fulfill their responsibility and obligation to society. That's what, in essence, what activism is all about. And over the past decades, you know, we've, we've had governments that have not been kind or thoughtful about the incredible importance of grassroots organizations, of women's organizations, of rights organizations, you know, whether it's about housing, whether it's about employment, whether it's about opportunities. When you provide the tool, empowerment comes from the tools that, you know, people have so that they can utilize it and then they can make things for themselves, make their lives better. Therefore, they will then feel better enough to be able to make other people's lives better. So I think women's organization, not just in Tower Hamlet, not just in, you know, as a parliamentarian, I have to remember that, you know, Tower Hamlet is not my whole world, although it is. Uh, East London is not my whole world, although it is. Um, there is, you know, world beyond, because, I can't empower myself in Wapping or London if the whole rest of my neighbors are in poverty or they're in conflict or they're in malice or they're facing discrimination. So it's really important that the, so women's organizations and, and you know, NGOs have suffered absolute drastic cuts. So I was involved in building developing and you know leading one of the first women's educational center although it was primarily for minority women because it happened to be based in Tahamlet it's called the Jagunari Center it was the first purpose built women's education center it was supposed to be available for everyone but it has been cut completely so it used to provide training it used to provide counseling it used to provide advice and in the absence of all of that Women who cannot stand for themselves, women who are not in good jobs like you or me, women who are not in, um, uh, they don't themselves feel confident enough, able enough to articulate themselves, their needs and their aspirations. They have to go to find NGOs to make them feel, become part of society, provide you know support and training and guidance and all that. If it's not there, the fabric of the society, little by little, ebbs away and pulls away. And we can see that in global conflict. And that's one of the first things we want to do when global conflicts uh, happen. We want to say, in the rebuilding process, how do we ensure we empower women? How do we ensure we empower uh, the small NGOs? You know, how are we going to do uh, rights and uh, training and all of that? We have to think, what about our home? You know, so for a long time as an activist, I've been out of my home for the best part of 40 years. And really um, some major catastrophe happened in my life, personal life. And I kind of re-engaged with the idea that it should have always been that my home should be safe first. Then I can make others safe, you know. And so for me, the communities themselves at the grassroots must be safe first before they can be better for their neighbors and their other communities. So, um, so what I was going to say is that uh, there has been some uh, um, attention to this factor, in particularly post-COVID. There's been a lot of discussion and as parliamentarians, we've been able to highlight some of our concerns. So the um, uh, you know, state aid is sometime available for um, women's aid where they, people find it, uh, find recomm accommodations, where they find advice and et cetera, if they're suffering violence or abuse and if they want to leave home or they want to, but that has to go cap in hand with enough resources for them to have go to housing, they have to be able to go to jobs. 
And this whole idea now that the jobs that people had access to are no longer available. And so there are, in, in our country, maybe 3 million people is going to become unemployed. And maybe there will be hundreds of millions of people you know, outside and, and globally who will become unemployed. And we have cut our feet and hands because we want to be away from Europe. We are no longer part of a, a broader you know, society, broader church, where we do not have access to our neighbors' jobs in the same way that we did before. We don't have the protection and the support and the guidance. We, don't, we have refused this, much to my you know, heartache. So I think generally and genuinely, I believe that not just women's organization, many, many important organizations who provide support and facilities and guidance and real sense of empowerment, of lifting, uplifting people's confidence and their ability to support themselves and be support to others have been uh, really cut down in such a way drastically. And I don't think we are going to see this resurgence of support coming because, you know, as a humanitarian, global humanitarian organization, that there is a real sense of donor fatigue. I, I know that myself because I visited refugee camps in many places. And same thing is now happening as a result of COVID to even national organizations and even more locally, local organizations. So of course, it is going to have huge impact. Maybe for the first time, unlike ever in our history of our, our time, maybe it has happened you know, decades and decades and decades ago, maybe in my, my mother's time, my grandmother's time, your mother's time, your grandmother's time, but not well in our generation. We haven't experienced the self-reliance that we have to provide in order to sustain our family, in order to sustain our communities. But I want to say this final thing, which is about this aspect of the community, is what I saw, because I, I was working a little bit with some of the women's organization, fundraising, just from my own family and friends. I did some, you know, foods and packets and um, women's stuff, you know, to raise some money for women's organization. Then they can um, circulate that. And um, we did dates and food during Ramadan and all that. Is that the human spirit and the resilience is so live, so impactful, even at our barest, most precious and difficult period of our lives, we can still, we have enough within us to rise and say, actually, I have to help my neighbors. What about my neighbors? You know, what can we do? And I saw this human spirit, honestly, my hair on my uh, you know, skin is standing. It was so profound and so, in, you know, so enlightening and so self-assurance, so much. Sorry, I felt really assured, you know, that, you know, humanity is still there, even though we are facing this gravest challenge, you know, of our generation. So, yeah. Thank, thank you for the insightful um, answer. Um, it was revealed in a recent report that ethnic minorities such as BAME uh, are at a disproportionately greater risk due to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been much discussion on what we can do to mitigate these disproportionate effects. Mm -hmm. So what do you think needs to be done in this regard to better protect our minority communities? Mm -hmm. I raised a a huge amount of questions about that in Parliament, as is my colleagues. And I'm really pleased about that, that we have at least asked these questions. We have, uh, as you know, about the Professor Fenton report, and he, his report is not the only one. Historically, I mean, I've been involved in community health advocacy uh, since um, early 80s. So we know that these prevalences of disadvantages exist it's not a new thing and subsequent governments have just failed utterly miserably to address this as they have 
failed utterly and miserably to address the issue of discrimination, not just against minority communities, but even if you dissect that, you know, against disabled people, against black people, or against Muslims, or against the Chinese. So there are all these layers of incredible discriminations, which has meant that the community has been paralyzed into some ghettos almost, you know, so their people are not living on any equal par. So the, those inequalities in societies have existed. And you, you know, uh, it's been heightened by the Black Lives Matter movements, but that movement, the anti-racist movement, alliances of discrimination have existed for decades, generations and centuries. And so it's not going to, they have not, systems, government have not addressed that. In fact, this has compounded the discrimination and wars and conflicts that we have taken part in, that we have created, that we have contributed to, have also induced these inequalities even further. And the, therefore the divisions, those inequalities, those interventions outside have also impacted in the divisions of you know human humane society uh, in different parts of the world indifferently and those conflict have purged into the forefront because of covid and then George Floyd's death of course so how do we eradicate it the we have the laws in place it is about political intention. It is about removing and be very serious. We talk too much. We, we say these things and then it's exactly the same way. Like, you know, I was speaking to one of the local charities. I don't want to talk about, you know, the global matter right now. If you focus it down, I was speaking to one of the global charities and they said to me recently and that they did an appeal on a television and there were hundreds of people ringing in and they're pledging, right? And then three days later, four days later, one month later, those pledges did not translate into the announcement that the television had made. So they say they collected, you know, one million pound. And in fact, what they really collected was 300,000. So, you know, we're so used to this meeting the challenges for words and so we look good, you know, we look good and then everything disappear underneath and, and what remains is the same poverty, same deprivation, same lack of housing, same inequalities in uh, jobs and frustrations. And I think we have to take some responsibilities. And so like I have always believed no one's going to give me something no one's going to give me something. I have to be aware that these are my rights. These are my responsibilities. These are my obligations. So I think government have to make sure that the facilities exist, that the resources exist, education and training and opportunity exists, which is going to be very difficult now, given what's happened to the world and global economy, as well as national and local economy. It, it is going to be the biggest challenge ever. And I give you uh, another example. Muslim women in this country, in our country here in the UK, is at the bottom rung of ladder in every single spheres of that discrimination. So Muslim men, for instance, are about 40%. Uh, they're out of the economy. They're not a part of the you know, um, workforce in that sense. But if you talk about Muslim women, they're like maybe 50, 60%. And even when they're in jobs, the kind of jobs they're getting is menial. You are aware of Canary Wharf. I live in Wapping in London. Canary Wharf is the heart, global heart, financial heart. City of London is stone throw away, but there has been no systemic strategies to address how do we make sure that our local children who are now, we, they're no longer not educated. They are, they've got graduates, they've got, you know, this is like, I am a second generation, 
My children are third generation in this country. My grandchildren are fourth generation born Bota in this country. So it's not like, it's, there's no excuse to say, these people don't speak English, they're not part of our societies, they're not contributing. None of that. It's, much of it is, you know, like kind of almost fabric of our imagination because it has always been the stereotypes that Muslims are like this, black people are like this. So we've got to be very cautious and careful and honor law of equality, social justice, and rights. And therefore, everybody, I don't know whether it's going to happen, okay? We've been here before. I've been here before. I, I've tried to raise the question with ministers about systemic racism within the health service. And they absolutely refuse to accept that there is any systemic racism or discrimination in the health service or in financial sector. As soon as you break it down by saying, how many CEOs reflecting the community? How many comes from, if it's a very large Turkish community and you have 2000 corporate sectors and none of those Turkish community are anywhere near the management sector, nowhere near the directorship, nowhere near the CEOs, no one near the chairs, chairmen, chairmen, they're usually chairmen, as you know then it makes no sense and it explains why the disparities persist. So unless and until we stop talking, I would like to see mandatory race equality audit of every institution. I would like to see, I, I would like to see targets being brought back. Tory government has completely been disparaging about targets. You know, just the way that they have dismissed, uh, you know, the numbers of women who should be in political uh, um, office, for instance, they say, no, if you, you're demeaning women, if you say you will have a quota or a target, for God's sake, at the current state, if we don't do something very serious about it, that means women, my great granddaughter, my great, great, great granddaughter is going to have to wait for 50, 50 equality in parliament. That is not acceptable, just as it is not acceptable that where on our doorstep there are jobs and our kids are young people and we have a very vibrant, educated young people, they cannot access any jobs beyond admin, beyond cleaning, beyond hospitality sector. It says that institutions are being discriminatory. It says nothing else, it says simply. So I think the solution are there for us to grab. We have to stop talking and say, we will enact any, you know, equality legislation. We will enact our, we will change the way things happen. We, will, we want to see the change happening. I don't know whether it is going to happen, but that's my hope because as an activist, you keep hoping and you keep doing, you know, you, uh, sort of like edge away little by little. Yeah, I totally understand. Um, you mentioned about solutions and acting about it. Um, yes, we need to talk, we need to bring the issues into attention, but I agree with you, acting is really quite important and bringing um, mm -hmm. the words that we are spending into life, really. Yes. Um, I would like to uh, ask you my next question uh, around um, resources being allocated and how women will be affected uh, around that. Um, as I said, available, available resources will be one obstacle to eradicate the issues faced by women in COVID and in empowering them. It has been noted that, for example, resources which are usually made available for sexual and uh, reproductive health services have had to be reallocated to responding to COVID. Uh, and the similar picture could be painted for emergency shelters uh, for victims of domestic abuse. Mm. Uh, resource scarcity will be an inevitable issue in post-COVID responses, especially with so many areas and sectors in need of aid. Um, so how can the national and international community ensure that gender equality will still be met even with concerns of resource allocation? 
Mm, I agree with you absolutely, completely. And, um, you know, I'm an officer of the All Party Parliamentary Group on uh, reproductive health rights and uh, population. And we've been working, I've been working on this issue, uh, like I said, for, I don't know, 30, 35 years, but in Parliament for the past 22 years. And we have really championed this, and including having visited a number of refugee camps to ensure that we pressurize government, you know, um, uh, UNICEF and uh, leading charity organizations, as well as our government when we come back from these uh, study tours, as we call it, to say, you know, put pressure on. And it has been fairly easy discussion, fairly easy negotiation up until recently with our international development organization in this country. As you know, it, it, is, it has been completely committed. So I think there are huge concerns and huge questions rising out of this new merger within Britain of you know, foreign office and uh, international development. We haven't had the opportunity to raise questions about it, except you know, in parliament just on, on hybrid question. It means we haven't had a proper debate about it. It's a fait accompli. It's been presented to us as something that's going to happen. So I think we will need to work very solidly together globally with women's organization, making sure our government becomes accountable. And one of the things that I always talk about is that many of our developing countries, and say, example, take Bangladesh, right? Uh, you know, the refugee camps I visited three times now. The leadership of the refugee camps and the NGOs primarily are from the Bangladeshi diaspora, right, locally. And they understand implicitly what the needs are. The solutions implanted from external organization is not going to be able to resolve matters. It has to work with the government. It has to work with um, the local people. And leadership, leadership decision-making must come. And this is something that I hope, you know, your organization will really focus on. Uh, the, the first lady of um, Turkey uh, uh, was one of the first leading women to visit the refugee camp in Bangladesh. I mean, amazing. And I think that she really inspired a whole generation of women who subsequently also went there to try and, you know, really be involved, not just give money and say, here's some money and do whatever, but really empower the local women to work with those women who are from disadvantaged background. Now, one of my other um, sort of like question has been over the last 22 years I've been in parliament is I've been asking government to ring fence money. So when they, you know, recently they, uh, our government gave massive injection to some local authority, although there's no way it's going to reach the women's organizations who are facing clients, hundreds of clients with domestic violence. It's not going to reach the people with disability who are dying in their, you know, hundreds in local homes because they don't have the support and they don't have the uh, carers uh, that can help them, that used to help them before COVID. So I think ring fencing um, money is really important, which means, I I'm sure you're familiar with the word, which is like you give this money. If, if Global Humanitarian Forum, Forum your, your organization, are working. I hope what you will argue for is to say, look, if you're targeting an organization or a country, you must say the terms under which in Britain, we give money, international development aid is given, and then we have a whole series of demand for, come from countries. We say you have to be fair to women, you have to be fair to um, LGTB community, you have to be fair to um, uh, disabled people and all of that. But it doesn't say this much money has to go to them. And we want to have proof of action. We want to see the result. We want to see the outcome. I'd also like to say, we want to see you employ these numbers of women, this, you know, so that, and they're local people. They're local. Of course, you have to be educated. You have to fill the criteria. But 
it's nonsense. It's nonsense any longer to suggest they're not qualified people out there. So I have never agreed uh, to the notion of, you know, development sort of like impose internationally or, you know, sort of like on downtrodden people. It has to come through the, you know, grassroots movement. It has to come through the very fine, finely balanced community where it can harmonize, you know, with the local condition. That's when aid impacts the greatest. And I can tell you, I am very, very familiar with quite a number of parts of Africa and uh, of course, Bangladesh, because that's where I was born. Uh, seeing the development up, you know, and empowering and flowering, you know, men and women into communities, which is then strengthened. So I believe the same principle should be applied in here in UK, in Tar Hamlet locally, or Newham, or Bromley, or, you know, Scotland, all of that. And only where you have people, you know, strategists, uh, of course, legislatures, when they've thought about these things in cohesion, in order to maximize the little resources we have, we're going to have to talk to each other. And we're going to have to say, we don't worry about replication anymore. We're going to have to find out what can be bought by each partner to the discussion and to the development and to the progress, you know. So, yeah, I, these things really intrinsically are kind of things that I, I can keep me awake at night. <laughs> I don't know. I hope, you know, like, like I said, I go back to hope and aspiration that we will do better. I think, yeah, that's why I, 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 I can wake up another day and say, yeah. And that's why our aim is to shape the future for a better tomorrow, really. Yeah like activists, uh, like ourselves. Um, another major issue uh, facing women is that of the unpaid care economy as highlighted in a policy brief by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Women yes. were already doing 76% of global unpaid care work according to the International Labour yes. Organization before the pandemic. But with increasing numbers of children not going to school, um, this has increased despite such care work largely remaining invisible uh, mm -hmm. and unaccounted for in economic responses to COVID. What can be done for women in these sorts of situations given that unpaid care work is largely seen as invisible within the work sector? Mm -hmm. So this invisible care has become ever so present, given that many men had to, for the first time, uh, return home and, and work. I mean, you know, my members of my family have experienced that, but uh, members of my family are pretty hands-on with their children, even if they're men. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I have that experience. And I think that if many more men had experienced at a higher level, the similar pressure maybe the, the policies would be changed so fast, we wouldn't need to argue about it at all. So I think what I would say is that it needs a reframing, it needs rethinking. And yeah, you, where you are at your level in your organization, seems to me we need to induce these discussions. We have really excellent uh, models in Europe you know, where they really value women being at home, uh, part of the economy of building children and building economy, building the communities in that kind of very, very, you know, like in such an incredibly, um, uh, such a, I just think is the right thing to do. I can't, I don't, my brain went to, into a Caesar just for a second because, you know, um, like I said to you, for the very first time uh, over the last five years or so, I've been more home than I'd been outside. And it's really made me think that the investment into my children's lives, and they've really been impacted because I'd been out since they were very, very young. 
And when I was in the community, when I was working as an activist, there were very few women. So the pressure on people like myself, the pressure on handful of people, handful of women in particular, leading anything, if you're pioneering something, whether it's in a small level or at a larger scale, nationally, internationally, it doesn't really matter. The pressure on you as an individual and then on your family is huge. And if you just think about it in that way, just imagine, you know, if, if a woman is empowered financially, I'd like to see that. I, I'd love to see a living wage being paid to women for being at home up to three years or something so that they have spent the formative years, if you like, with their um, family, their children, their upbringing. And then they've skilled a good human person to then take on the world. And then subsequently, what it would be revelation if that happens anywhere near my generation. I'm 60, you know, I'm 61 actually. So I don't know that I will witness such a incredible intrinsic changes in our society. But working conditions, the way we work, the way we live, everything is an uproar. And to shape it now in a way that would shape our, our humanity, yes, that's great. But to shape our environment, our home environment, help men and women in their home environment and then they can together build with their neighbor a better environment of a community and then their you know their their own space in their own locality and then nationally it's a very simple solution in fact that's what we say when we go to develop other countries we have to apply the same principle to us now because Maybe if we can do better, others will do, learn from, from that. So rather than saying, and maybe we learn, maybe we, we have to say, hands up, we really got it wrong. Let's learn from some other places where people do better. Thank you so much. My final question to you today, uh, we've taken so much of your time. Uh, so um, I, I, I feel a bit, you know, uh, hesitant. <laughs> Uh, what is your final message uh, to the audience today, especially to those who are advocating for the gender equality? It's, it's been the question in my life because I come from a lineage of very strong women, and, but women who've been enabled by their fathers, you know, so... Uh, and then their family members to really be themselves. This is not to say that women or those who are empowered, those who are, have the freedom to be working and living as they feel, they don't have problems. I've got tons of issues, you know, personally with the family, putting all of that aside, you know, it, we would benefit so much if we simply gave the tool to all human beings, men and women equally, we would have a better society. And I just think that it's been such a privilege to be able, I'm sorry to say this, this horrendous disease has made it absolutely impossible to go out. And it has been one of the best gift I can say that I have experienced you know, may God forgive me for saying that, that I was actually able to give myself time, give time to people that I love. So it's very difficult for me to give any messages. I just want to say, be the best that you want to be. be do everything that you can and know that there are others out there to support. Internet is such an incredible thing now, right? that I can find you and you can find me. And if, if I don't have the family support that, you know, I have family support, maybe you don't have the family support, but we can help each other and we can reach out. And that is an amazing gift. So yeah, let's just, let's just be kind to each other, but speak up, very important to speak up and take control of the community that you are surrounded by 
And you can make so much difference because it's only time. It's only a matter of time. So. Well, so Dean, we cannot thank you enough for your time today and for this stimulating conversation. It has been just an amazing one. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.